Again, I'm going to apologize up front. Uh, I'm going to just kind of hang out here today. And if anybody, if any, let me start over. If any of you tell me this is the best sermon I've ever preached today, uh, we're going to have a fight. <laughs> we all have, don't we, uh, our pet peeves? couple of you do. We have our pet peeves. You know that thing that just kind of gets under your skin when it happens? One of mine, it really is, one of mine is, is when you're driving down the highway and uh, there's a sign that says, get over, because you have a lane crossing. And so you get over and you're in that lane going slow and here comes some idiot flying by you, clear down. And if you're like me, he actually tries to stick the nose of the car in right in front of you. That, that's a pet peeve of mine. That, that, I don't like that. How about you? If the sign says get over, get over, right? Trying to get up, you know, you're trying to be nice and some idiot comes by you and what is that anyway? I don't know. Maybe it's uh, people who run the stoplight. You, you know what? That only saves you three minutes, they tell you. The average stoplight is three minutes. One of the other ones that gets me is, quite frankly, parking in the parking lot of a store. And um, if you need those um, mobility issues. If you have mobility issues and need to park in that blue spot, praise be to God. And generally, even if there's a spot that's not got a blue thing in it and it's close to the store, generally I'll park further away because I don't have walking issues and there might be someone who does. But what bothers me is someone who flies in that spot and bounces out of the car and bounces into the store with more agility than, than a gymnast. Um, it gets under my skin. But it doesn't move me to action. Those are pet peeves. There are hot button issues, however, aren't there, that, that get deeper than under your skin. They, these are issues that cause you to actually uh, act and do something. Uh, one of the things that really will cause me to act, and we've done it a couple of times, uh, is following a person in a car who's obviously drunk, you know, and is dangerous, going to kill themselves or someone else. Uh, that's a hot but it button issue. I, I really have, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, if you like your beer, fine. If you like your wine, fine. And, and I, I don't mind some wine. I really don't. But don't drink to the point of being inebriated and then get in a car. Um, and that will cause me to act. That will cause uh, us to act and, and uh, do something about it. I don't know what your hot button issue is, but we all have them as well. We all have that thing that will make us just do something about it. My mother uh, hated gossip, just hated it. I don't know if it's from where she came from or her life or whatever, but she hated it. And um, if I don't care if we were in a church meeting, we were out in the public arena, and someone was spouting off, um, she would actually uh, do something about that. Oops, there we are. She would tell them, tell them to be quiet. I think that's why, um, I think that's why I don't enjoy gossip. In fact, if I hear it, I forget it. And that's an, that's an honest truth. I, I can't remember gossip. 
And I really think it's a psychological fear of my mother, actually. <laughs> I really do. I don't, otherwise, I don't know why um, it just does not find a place in my mind to stick. So I, I'm, just not, I'm just not a real good gossip. But we all have those hot button issues, and I've learned over the years uh, in, in terms of couples' relationships, we know what hot button issue our spouse has as well, don't we? We know how to push these hot button issues. But an interesting thing in psychology, an interesting study was done, is, is, that, is that while we might be moved to call the police if we see a loiterer in our neighborhood, we don't like that, somebody we don't know, somebody who looks like uh, a transient, somebody who looks a little rough. While we're liable to call the police, that will move us to action, that we, we tend not to be moved to action in much larger injustice issues. And the study was done particularly uh, looking back on the Bosnian uh, conflict in the early 90s where uh, there were uh, broad uh, reports and solid evidence that people were being slaughtered in, in a way that hadn't happened since World War II. And uh, the U.S., the population, as well as the population of uh, especially Western Europe, uh, turned a blind eye. If the injustice is close to us, or we feel injustice, we, we act. But it, if it's injustice is somewhere else, we seem to think it's okay. Let somebody else handle it. But as we look at Jesus, he was able to keep things in better perspective than we are. Turn that back, I'm sorry. Turn that back one. Um, Jesus kept things in proper perspective. Jesus' world was full of people who wanted to hand him hot button issues as well. He understood, however, that the real hot button issues had something to do with salvation had something to do with eternal life, had something to do with that which has far more eternal impact than the things that tend to get us upset in our day today. Someone came to Jesus and said, tell, him, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. Jesus knew how to handle that. It had nothing to do with eternal significance. He told him, I'm not a judge between you and your brother. James and John came to him and said, we want positions of power and authority when you come into your kingdom. Jesus understands that they are in completely ignorant in that request. It's wonderful that he doesn't uh, condemn them because of their ignorance. It, I think that's wonderful at the very least because it suggests that maybe I will not be condemned in my ignorance as well. But he does not move to action because of what they try to get him to do. The crowds pressed in upon him in the Gospel of John because they wanted more food to eat and they wanted more bread. And Jesus knew that that was not his mission, that to get caught up even in, in the request of the masses would be to move him from his stated purpose. His purpose was the cross, which they couldn't understand, and I'm not sure we fully understand, but his purpose was one of salvation, uh, far greater, far uh, more important than we could understand. And it's interesting, even in the kangaroo court that is set up where he is um, unfairly accused, where he is beaten, where he's mocked, humiliated, 
Jesus is not moved to some kind of, of anger where he responds in a way that causes him to lose his dignity. He sees God clearly. He understands God clearly and knows that in some level, at least, in some sense, that even what he is going through is necessary to accomplish the greater goal of Almighty God, the greater goal for the greater good of, of the entire world. He knows the things that agitate most of us are simply just not important. But our text today does show us that he does have some hot button issues. And it might be good for us to take a look at that so that we can understand maybe in our faith there are places that we need to pay a little bit more attention to as well. And so I want to read the scripture for you this morning. And it comes to us um, from out of the Gospel of John, second chapter, verses 13 through 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them out of the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins to the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, disciples recalled what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This text has often been used as a way to say that things should never be sold in a church. And in the past, it has been used in a way to say we shouldn't even be able to bring food into the church. But I submit to you that what Jesus gets upset about is much deeper than um, what we might call annoyances. We need to be remember that when we look at this text, that, and in the Gospel of John particularly, where there are always two levels of things happening. The surface level, the, the message, the story we get, and the deeper message that we are supposed to uh, glean from the scriptures. And so when we read it superficially, we might be able to say, oh, well, yep, see, he didn't like things sold in the temple. But when we look at what he is actually addressing, we recognize a greater significance. We want to remember that temple sales had been established in the law. When Jesus went in, uh, he went into the temple to cleanse it, knowing that in the law, he, he knew the Hebrew scriptures very well. In the law, it was designated for a particular purpose. You could not take uh, coins from the world that were used for all kinds of non-sacred things and give them to the treasury you had to exchange the coins that floated out in the world for coins that didn't float out around the world in the treasury, in the temple treasury, so you gave a particular kind of coin to the treasury. It would be like today, you not being able to take a dollar out of your pocket, or hopefully a 20, okay, um, and put it right in the plate. You would have to first come in the door and take that money and exchange it for a certain kind of thing that you could then put in the plate so that the, the dollar itself would be a sacred thing. Likewise, your, your sacrifice had to be without blemish. You couldn't just go to the marketplace, buy a dove, 
or a lamb or whatever it is and take it to the temple. It had to be without blemish. And so it was established that there were these places where those lambs that were already checked could be purchased so that they could be a part of the sacrificial system. The doves particularly were an issue for the poor, that they were to be at a purchasable price so the poor could be a part of the, of the sacrificial system. And what was happening here is, is that the uh, uh, elite, and I hate to say this, I hate to I keep saying it, because it calls us into question. The religious elite found a way to get wealthy off of this. And so instead of offering uh, something that would help the people be a part of the sacrificial system, they were uh, charging outrageous prices. They were robbing people. And it is that that Jesus gets a little bit upset about. In fact, the Bible tells us that he went and he made a whip. And he got mad. He's mad that the temple has been turned into a profiteering adventure and at the expense of the people. He is mad that business has drowned out God's holy presence. He's mad at the priests whose love of law took precedence over love of God and God's people. He's mad at the sacrifice over humility before Almighty God. But as we look at this, we need to ask ourselves, if Jesus came into our house of worship, what would be the issues that he would be uh, happy with or uh, upset at today? And I think it's a critical question for us as we look at the trends of the church of Jesus Christ in our present day. I wonder if he would be happy uh, with how we are actually uh, moving into the world. I wonder if he would be happy with uh, the number of people we have discipled. I wonder if he would be happy with what we have determined is important and what we seem to let slide. I do wonder whether Jesus would make a whip today and say, you know what, you have taken my bride and you have uh, defamed her before the world. It's one of the real critical uh, criticisms that comes to us today from the, those that have looked at the church and have completely walked away is, is their failure to see what, what is called authentic Christian walks before Almighty God. A life that looks like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I've wondered, what gets our ire up today? What is it that, that, that causes us to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ? I hate to mention this today especially uh, because I don't have any, it seems. <laughs> what are we, what are we, <clears throat> excuse me, what are we passionate about today? What, 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 what really gets us moving for the Lord Jesus Christ? It's interesting, as I was thinking about this, for, actually for the uh, seminar that I uh, gave yesterday, I was thinking about this. When I, when I talk about passion, uh, it, call, it, it, it occurred to me that, that on times when I really get passionate speaking, Almost every time someone has said, man, you are, uh, you are angry today. No, 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 you'll know if I'm angry. But we don't know what to do with passion. Uh, uh, we've kind of worked it out of our lives. And one of the things the young people are saying to us today is, um, yeah, the Christ you talk about is not compelling. You don't even seem to believe it that well yourself. We have an opportunity to, to reach this world still, but we must uh, again remember what it was that, that got a hold of us. You know, that thing that caused uh, the hairs to, to rise up your spine and up the back of your neck in, in, in the presence of the divine God. 
and to be able to talk about this Jesus with a little bit of passion in our lives because we're not going to win the world if we can't talk with passion. What is it that gets your ire up for the Lord Jesus Christ today? Concern for self or concern for others? I, I was watching a program on the news. It was news. I watch uh, news and comedy. How about that? I watch a little bit of news, and then I turn a comedy on to kind of balance from the news that I've watched. But, <clears throat> excuse me, it was a, a, a news person who was asking, uh, I forget who it was, who was asking a person about the issues for today. And he said, you know what? I guess it was because of the Selma issue that they're celebrating right now. He said, you know what? In the 60s, people were passionate about things. People had a concern that was greater than themselves, a concern that reached out to the broader community. And one of the things we're struggling with today, it seems that we no longer really have concern for the broader community, that we have a concern for ourselves and what we are going to be able to accomplish and what we can purchase for ourselves. What really is, is that that gets you going for the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it politics or people? Re remember this as we uh, will go into another political cycle, especially with the presidential elections coming up. Remember this, Jesus always chose people over any political concern. We cannot deny that. We cannot minimize that. And when the church of Jesus Christ remembers that, we will again be the force that changes this world for good. Maybe, maybe, maybe that can become a hot button issue for us. That we will decide at all places and everywhere to choose people over power, people over politics, people over any other thing in the world. Thank you.